Hello. Hey, I'm Jeff Hogue. I am a senior cybersecurity engineer with Echelon Risk and Cyber. And I uh, just wanted to take a moment to introduce myself. Um, I've been working with technology uh, for about 19 years. Um, and uh, roughly about eight years ago, I pivoted. My previous experience was with network engineering and systems administration. And uh, after doing that as a generalist for about 11 or 12 years, I pivoted over to cybersecurity and uh, helped build a cybersecurity program at a healthcare company. Um, and uh, moving from network engineering and systems administration up to security, it's, it's almost like I, I did things the wrong way or saw things done the wrong way, whichever. And uh, I got tired of that, wanted to start fixing some of those issues. And, um, and so I entered into the security profession about eight years ago uh, exclusively. And uh, about a year ago, I moved over to uh, consulting at Echelon Risk and Cyber. Um, Echelon is a full services cybersecurity firm. And um, I'm really happy to be there. We work in defensive security, offensive security, and also virtual CISO. Um, something about me, I am a lover of dad jokes. That's just a warning ahead of time. Um, in fact, my daughter who traveled here with me today has uh, taken a look at some of my slides and she was appalled by the age of some of the memes uh, that I'm using. So I apologize ahead of time for the Civil War era memes. Um, but, uh, but I look forward to talking to you today. Also, I live in North Carolina, came up here today. This is my first ever time in New York. And I hear this side of New York is better than the other side of New York. That's what I've heard so far today. Um, so again, really happy to visit here. Um, today, I'm talking about mitigating radioactive directory, or how do you keep Active Directory from becoming radioactive? Um, I'll say this, this comes at a really good time right after Richard spoke. Uh, this, this talk is geared towards defenders. It's geared towards systems administrators or people perhaps that have inherited environments where the door might be open on AD. Um, I work a lot with very busy sysadmins, busy CIOs, busy risk managers, and busy security departments. And um, a lot of this is a stream of consciousness from that side of things that I do. Um, and, and while Richard talked about SOC investigations and detections, and those common threats. Today I'm going to be talking about how organizations frequently have the door open on Active Directory. Um, one other thing I like to say when I, when I begin speaking is this. If you learn just one thing over the course of time during this talk, or at least if I do, if I sit through an hour long talk or a 45 minute long talk and, and come away with one thing that's practical, it's worth sitting there uh, through the whole presentation. So much of what I present today may be things that you knew already, uh, but hopefully you can learn one thing. Um, last little housekeeping note, uh, there are on these slides a number of links, resources, even command line uh, tools. At the end of the presentation, there will be a link or a URL so you can go and download a PDF copy of the presentation. There's also a QR code, but because we don't trust those, uh, we have a no paranoia URL as well. So. Uh, First of all, what I'm going to talk through today is the problem with Active Directory. And I'm going to talk about zero trust and some of these buzzwords we use and how uh, saying the word zero trust doesn't really make things better. Does anyone realize that? Um, I'm going to talk about the contributors to AD issues and how we can start addressing that uh, in our environments. And then I'll be speaking through some common misconfigurations that, uh, that we see in AD environments and finally close out. Um, I, I, I first want to talk about this problem, and this is, this is Jeff. This is a Jeff-ism. But I, I like to say it's easier to implement new tools or new technology than to clean our own house. And let me start off by saying, who, who's heard of zero trust? <laughs> OK, who's tired of hearing about zero trust? Okay, just about the same hands went up. It's a common moniker. And zero trust, this, this, this architecture, this thinking comes from a really good place. It comes from a place of we can no longer say the words, well, we trust it just because it's inside our network or inside our domain. Um, zero trust comes from never trust, always verify. Not the old thinking of trust, but verify. And the, the thing is, 
zero trust is usually attributed to networks. And I don't understand that because most of the time when you type in zero trust into Google and you see uh, lots of things pop up, really all you see is network-based solutions. Um, and, and you see solutions that, that help fix this issue of micro-segmentation, but, but what, what drives me crazy, this is just me as a defender, is seeing the words zero trust being sold as a product. Okay, and, and I've had this discussion left and right. Um, lots of vendors are out there that will sell zero trust as a product. In fact, I've, I've heard vendors tell me, we're not a VPN solution, we're zero trust. Do you know zero trust isn't a protocol? I actually tried to look. Do you know there's not an RFC listed for zero trust or ZTNA, ZTRA? And it's amazing how many products have been slapped with that word zero trust, implying that if you, if you just buy the right product or you just implement the right product in your environment, you can check the box, you're zero trust, you're good to go. Um, so let me read a couple of quotes here. Um, and and I, I know there's a micro-segmentation thought process of zero trust, um, but there's actually five pillars. If you read about zero trust architecture, there's five pillars to it. And networks is just one pillar there. Though zero trust is marketed and boxed as a set of products that tend to be geared towards network, it's actually a lot wider of an architecture. It's a, it's a, it's a way of thinking. Um, and, and so identity, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, identity is a standalone pillar of zero trust. Um, and uh, uh, many of us have overlooked identity in our zero trust initiatives. In fact, Greg Tuhill, who helped frame the architecture of zero trust, he's the former US CISO, uh, he, he said this, identity is the core component of any successful zero trust implementation. Just a quick side note, if you ever give security talks, be careful who you quote when giving security talks. Because I, I quoted Greg Tuhill, and I've done this in a number of different talks on, on different topics regarding identity before, and I happened to be speaking at an event in Pittsburgh. I had no idea who Greg Tuhill was other than our former CISO, US CISO, and he also helped frame zero trust architecture. And I stepped off the stage, and none other than Greg Tuhill himself came up to me and said, you owe me a beer. I didn't know who he was. And he said it again. And again, I didn't know who he was, and he flipped his badge around and he said, I'm Greg Tuhill. And uh, anyway, he joked around with me for a little bit, but he said, thank you for saying that. Thank you for talking about zero trust not being a product. This is, this is something I, I've been trying to address for a very long time. Um, but here, here's the deal. When we think about this architecture of zero trust, many of us are in organizations where that, that buzzword's being used, or we have initiatives where that architecture is being built up. We come, many of us come from backgrounds where if we get a piece of technology, we can implement it. You give us a switch or a firewall, we can put it in place. We can rack stack and configure it. You give us a server, we can implement it, but not so with zero trust. It's an architecture and it's going to take continuous effort. And again, I'll just say again, we get excited about new tech and new tools, but we don't necessarily get excited about cleaning our house. Has anyone ever heard of the Nirvana fallacy? The Nirvana fallacy states that anything less than perfect isn't worth doing. And this is a line of thinking that we subscribe to from time to time as human beings. And in fact, here's an example of the Nirvana fallacy. Seat belts are a bad idea because people are still going to die in car crashes. Now we can spot the, legit, the, the logic issue in this, in this statement, but when it comes to something like Active Directory, where we've perhaps inherited environments where there's decades of debt that's piled up, there's this temptation that we have in looking at the mess and saying, well, one of these days someone's going to come up with a better system than Active Directory, so we just let it be. Our temptation is waiting for some new identity system and hoping we won't get breached in the meantime. And by the way, if you've looked at Active Directory for long, you, you may have noticed Microsoft has tried to put new graphical user interfaces, new UIs for AD, and they've come and gone. And it's amazing, every admin that I've ever seen in AD, they still use ADUC. 
It's the same tool that we used in Windows 2000. Um, and so we don't need to subscribe to this thinking that something better is going to come along, so let's just not do anything. That's, that's nonsense. That's like getting up every morning knowing we should brush our teeth because we haven't brushed our teeth in a year, but saying one of these days someone's going to invent a better toothbrush and then I'm going to start brushing. Okay? Almost every major data breach involved a weakness in identity somewhere in the kill chain. Um, Verizon's data breach investigations report, this is from a few years ago, said 80% of hacking-related breaches are linked to identity, identities. And uh, we've got to do this better. Um, the thing about AD that's used in the vast majority of organizational environments is there's vulnerabilities that are left behind and inherited, in many cases from multiple directory migrations. I've seen environments that came from even pre-Windows 2000, from systems like NT and Novell GroupWise and Lotus Notes. And what's happened is organizations have pushed the ball forward, they've upgraded the servers, they've upgraded the schema, they've migrated the objects to a new directory, but many of the old artifacts are still left behind. Many of the old vulnerabilities are still left behind. Um, also, something else that we see time and time again is bad habits from previous team members. People who meant well, but previous team members, they're left behind, and our environments, the, the debt continues to pile up. Um, one example is bad habits, all right? I'm telling you, I, 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 I see it time and time again where a call will come into a well-meaning help desk member who perhaps wasn't trained to know better that checks that box, that dreaded password never expires box because, well, it was a VIP that called in and they're locked out because their password expired and I need to help them out. Or perhaps they untick the box, user must change password on the first sign-in, and the, the same password the help desk told them is what they're running around with. Um, we also see still, even today, where sysadmins may put in place the same password for all service accounts, not knowing any better. Um, there's also test configurations that stick. I can't tell you how many production environments I've seen over the last almost couple of decades where there's a word like test that's stuck in the application name because what they thought was a test actually became the, the platform that was rolled out into production. Um, we also see this again. We continue to see service accounts that were intended to be delegated for a specific application or a specific purpose given elevated access, given, given admin level access. And here's what happens. When this debt piles up, there's fear that comes about. We, we know there's issues in our, our environment. We know the specific service accounts where there's dragons behind changing something there. But as information security professionals, much of the time we get fear around it. No one wants to be the one that broke things. So we kick the can down the road. No one wants to be the person who took out the business critical app that was put together 20 years ago with no great test system, by the way. We don't want to be that individual. And this is why many of the efforts to secure or harden AD are short-lived. Usually there's one person or a couple of people that lead a crusade to help fix AD, one siloed person, and when this person leaves the organization or when the initiative is over, eventually the company starts regressing. And there's backsliding and much of the progress is lost because those habits, they begin again. So how do we address this issue? First of all, we need to measure AD against best practices. It's going to be painful. There are ways to do this with a little bit of automation. There's products out there uh, that can help measure AD in a, in, a, in a macro sense against best practices. We need to look for common misconfigurations. But we can't just stop with assessing. We need to remediate those vulnerabilities. And sometimes that's going to be painful. Sometimes that's going to be a long, drawn-out change management process where we stub our toe and we ask the business to be patient with us or we try to test really what we can, but we have to remediate those. But, but the third step is this. We need to continuously monitor and continuously optimize Active Directory. When you're, when you're done with this assessment and remediation process, you're not really done. 
and uh, old habits will creep in occasionally. And so without this continued effort of keeping AD cleaned up, the directory will eventually regress back. Uh, I mentioned before I live in North Carolina and I've been mowing for about two months since it's gotten warm outside and I, if you look at my grass right now, you wouldn't believe that I've been mowing for two months because it looks like there's a possible foreclosure at my property uh, from the length of it. But, but the point is, if you've gone a really long time without mowing your grass, you know that that first time it's going to take a little bit more effort. It's, things are not going to be perfect and it's going to take a lot more time to do it. But when we continuously mow that lawn, when we continuously keep that yard cleaned up, it becomes a lot, uh, a lot easier each time. And so this is a painful process that can be done manually or it can be done with the help of a little bit of automation, but we've got to commit to keeping our directories clean. Uh, it's not a one-time task. Identity platforms, whether they're AD or another one, they need to be consistently monitored, corrected, and protected. So. I'm going to talk through a few common misconfigurations and how to resolve them uh, that we see in Active Directory. Uh, I'll also say I work for a company. We perform a full Active Directory security assessment. It goes into a lot of different domains. I'm going to share today a lot of what we run into on a lot of engagements. We run into this regardless of industry. Um, and uh, these are just some high level, uh, high level items that we see, but it just scratches the surface in what an in-depth assessment may, uh, may uncover. The first is, and this should come as no surprise, poor password practices. Now I realize a lot of these can be extrapolated out of AD and they hit in our policies, they hit in our cybersecurity awareness training, they hit in even, even other systems. But let's face it, generally poor practices are found in AD before any other application, or they're easier to find there. Um, so obviously, we, we all know, check your password policies. Check your password uh, uh, requirements. Eight character passwords aren't gonna cut it anymore. Length and complexity, but also, I think many of us know you can hit that minimum number of characters and still have an awful password. Has anyone seen this, this, this syntax of passwords that appears? It's really secure. It is the month, the year, and an exclamation point. Have you run into that in the wild? Anybody want to admit to that? Okay. We know who we're doing our password spray attacks against right now, don't we? Breached credential protection should be put in place. Um, what you should do is audit, at the very least, audit or crack your passwords against common breach lists. Now you can do this manually, you can do this with John the Ripper if you're interested, I can send you a script that, where you can run through it, uh, extract your hashes from AD and uh, crack the passwords. Please make sure you talk to management first and it's okay before you pull hashes out of AD, I should say. Um, but there's also a number of freeware tools. Novi4 has a free freeware tool to do this. Black Hills InfoSec has Cred Defense Toolkit. But going through this process helps uncover a lot of things. And namely, it helps uncover bad habits in the environment. What these tools will generally do is will compare your password hash database against, uh, against uh, hash lists. Um, like the Rocky lists um, and, and the uh, uh, Have I Been Pwned list. Once you realize how bad this issue is, it's going to tell you if people are running around with commonly breached passwords. It's also going to tell you if people are using duplicate passwords. Um, so th this is going to give you a lot of firepower to lead the organization in fixing these issues. Um, now you can take it a step further. I'll tell you, I recommend in Microsoft shops, turn on this feature. If you run Office 365 and you have at least Azure AD P1, if you run Office 365 at all and you have AADP1 at least, turn on Azure Password Protection. You may not be all in, but if you are, if you are synchronizing your directory to Azure AD, Azure Password Protection, there's a single agent, you deploy to your domain controllers, and Microsoft will automatically, every time there's a password change in your environment, they'll compare that password that's being set against the breach database. Overnight, 
overnight, a lot of these breached passwords can go away, or at least in the next password change. Um, so that's a very, very, in my opinion, it's a very underutilized uh, option that most organizations already have. They just need to install it. Um, also, commonly look for accounts with password never expires. Just query the database. See if there's, first of all, see if there's any human being accounts that have password never expires. And maybe, just maybe, there's service accounts that have been running around for 15 years with the same password. Yes, those service accounts, everyone's afraid to touch because of critical apps. Um, I mentioned before, many of these tools, these freeware tools, can show you where the same password is being used across multiple users. What does that tell you? That tells you there's bad habits. And what I've found is when multiple users are using the same password, either, either those users are just sharing passwords, or I found in many cases it's a learned habit from the company's own IT department. I talked before about how sometimes a well-meaning help desk person can start a snowball rolling. What happens if you've never worked in an environment before, you have no idea how to set a strong password, and the help desk gives you this password, it's super secure, it's the word password with a capital P and the number one, and you don't have to change it. What do you think happens when your password expires? What do you think you're going to set your password to? Password two, or maybe password three, or you come up with a more creative number. And what happens is the snowball, st snowball starts rolling because of one learned habit from probably a well-meaning person that didn't know better. Um, so looking for duplicate password usage can help detect some of these bad habits. Um, and the other thing to really look for, as I mentioned before, with these bad habits, many of them are learned from IT departments. I've been there. I've worked in the IT department. Um, but I, I'm telling you, many of the, and many of the times, users, they, are, they do what they're instructed. And they run with a habit that they learn on their first day working for an organization. Um, one thing I encourage you to do, if you believe that this is happening, that users are just being set passwords for them, um, and, and they're running around with them, compare your administrative password resets. There's a specific event ID where an admin will reset the password. Compare that with the password last set time. If it's the same time, then we know that someone in the organization is unticking that user must change password on next change. Did I see a question there? Uh, uh, across different accounts? Y yes, that's what I'm speaking through. So if you if you use one of these tools, um, again, Black Hills has the Cred Defense Toolkit. No before has weak password tests. You can also do this manually. You see the hashed version of the password, the NTLM hash. You're not seeing the password itself, but if two hashes equal one another, we can deduce that two or more users share the same password. Even if we didn't crack it, even if it didn't show up in a breach list, and so this helps us understand where bad habits are. Once upon a time, one company that I used to work for that might be north, south, east, or west of here, but you know it's not in North Carolina because I've never, or in, in New York because I've never been in New York before. I saw about a half dozen users in the organization that had the same password that was shared, but we didn't crack it. It was a strong password. And it wasn't on any of the breach lists either. And one day I'm walking around and I walk into the training room where brand new reps for this organization are trained and I see on a post-it note that the training account that everyone shares because it's a really low level segmented account, there's a very specific, very secure password there. You know what we did? We added that to the password filter. We found out in this organization that people were going into the training room, they were reusing this strong password, and when they set up their own user account, they said, I'll just use that training password that I already had written down. It's easy, right? So when you use a password filter like Azure uh, Password Protection, and there's others, put those. Learn the habits of the users and strengthen your password filter based on that. That's a great question, by the way. Um, so uh, another question, and I know this goes beyond AD just a little bit, but if there's password reuse, 
uh, where people are using the same password in AD and some other app. Um, this is a really tough thing to pre prevent. It really is going to take great security awareness training. Um, but what I tell people across the board is SSO all the things. Um, firm up or harden the, uh, the identity provider that you use, whatever you use. If it's Okta, if it's Azure AD, harden that. Use single sign-on wherever possible, wherever you can, and then where you can't use single sign-on. Where it doesn't make sense to do it, use an enterprise password manager. I'll also tell you it's really hard to get standard users, non-technical users, to use a password manager. Has anyone else had that struggle? <laughs> Training? That's a, that's a difficult thing to do. Um, and I'll tell you, 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 can go through the, you can go through the process of doing things like turning off Chrome, its password manager, and Edge. And if people don't want to use whatever password manager you give them, they go back to Post-it notes, Notepad, OneNote. It's going to require a, a lot of effort there. Um, and that leads me to believe that, that users and admins need to be educated. Password issues are often behavioral, not technical. Um, speaking of behavioral, I'm spending a lot of time on passwords, but I, I just want to uh, open this up a little bit if it's helpful. Um, once upon a time, I worked with a help desk person, I, I had to, or a help desk, entire help desk, to help improve these issues. And passwords were being set in the format on this meme. All right, I just made this up a couple of years ago, but uh, passwords were being set based on the same format, either season or month, the year followed by the exclamation point. And they were still being said at the time, filters weren't available in this environment or it wasn't possible to put them in. So here's what we did. Has anyone seen this Cheeto meme before? Okay, it's commonly used. And, and I think the original one is admin and password. Well, what happened was this environment, these, these bad passwords kept being set for users. And I eventually talked to the help desk manager. We got training for these people. It kept happening. It kept happening. And so at the same time, I had HR after me because HR in the environment I worked in, they wanted newsletter content. And I thought, we've got to fix this issue. So I wrote an article on setting stronger passwords. And instead of titling the article, here's how to set strong passwords, I titled the article, Don't Set Cheeto Passwords. And I used Microsoft Paint because I'm really creative like that. I used Microsoft Paint to change the original meme and use an actual password in the format that was being set, that we were, we were constantly auditing and forcing people to change. And what happened over the course of about a month, I got several calls from people in the organization. I got a call from a director level person that said, one of my employees just lectured the help desk to stop setting them Cheeto passwords. Okay. But this is going to require, behavior change is going to require a lot of effort. I want to get beyond that because we're going to get back into AD issues. Um, but focus especially on your privileged and your service accounts. Any accounts that have delegated privileges, um, look at your password last set time. Please, look at that. Is, is the same password that's been used since 2002 in place? That, that's going to be something you want to deal with. In fact, I, I'm only half kidding on the 2002 passwords. If you find that, if you find accounts that are set up in that way, and it's probably one of these service accounts that people are afraid to touch, you may find that it uses LM hashes. Has anyone run into LM hashes in the wild? This is an old hashing method from Microsoft that predates Windows 2000, where passwords are hashed eight characters at a time. Eight characters at a time. In fact, it's not even case sensitive. So you can go, there's websites online where they have the entire rainbow table of LM hashes available. You can drop a hash, not that I would do this in a web form, but you can drop a hash into this web form, hit submit, and it'll give you the password. So look for LM hashes, and in fact, um, I can share with anyone who's interested, there's a very specific GPO that many environments turned on years ago and they just left on that allows LM hashes in their environment. I'll mention that shortly. Um, finally, don't forget your local admin passwords. Uh, lots of environments, there's local admin accounts where the passwords are never changed. Um, and we recommend across the board, use LAPS. If you can, use LAPS. Use some, or use some kind of a technology where passwords are consistently rotated. LAPS is free. 
If you run Windows environments, it's probably free for you to implement. It's going to take a little bit of effort. Um, if, if you're not uh, fortunate enough, I think Taylor mentioned the PAM solution to afford a PAM solution there. Um, quickly, I'm going to mention overprivileged users and endpoints. Look at your delegated privileges. And this is a little more, this is a little deeper than just looking at domain admins and enterprise admins and schema admins, all these, you know, really powerful groups. Um, Microsoft's got a resource, again, anyone who wants the slide deck, there's a download uh, at the end. Um, take a look at this Microsoft link. Microsoft shows you how to dive in and see what delegate permissions are set. In many cases, in many environments, entire groups ran across a, a, an environment once upon a time where the domain users group was delegated permission to reset user passwords. And no one touched it. And it wasn't obvious either, because it's domain users. It's built in. Everyone's a part of it. So look at your delegated privileges, especially these that are on the screen. Um, replicating password hashes. Uh, by the way, if you ever do a password, I, I mentioned before cracking your AD passwords, either through a freeware tool or through a homegrown grown method. Um, if you ever do that, you're actually doing that very thing. You're replicating your hashes. Uh, EDRs will catch you doing this if you have a decent EDR. Um, also look for unconstrained delegation. Um, and also, do you have service accounts in these pesky protected groups? Again, we see this a lot in critical environments where a service account will be given domain admin privileges and then it works. And then the promotion happens, the code promotion happens, our platform is put in place, and that thing that a well-meaning engineer always meant to get back to, guess what, it's not prioritized because the code went into promotion. The business has moved on. We can't spend the time and effort to potentially break that application now. So this is going to require some attention to putting least privilege in place, even for those pesky service accounts in these big groups. Uh, look for stale and never used accounts. Um, I found in many cases uh, this, is, this comes down to lack of inter-office communication. Um, I hate to say it, this is the case, but uh, usually it's, it, it's people not communicating with one another is the reason for stale accounts. Um, Users who they maybe they got hired and they never began their employment. We started seeing this at the beginning or in the middle of the pandemic, uh, where people just didn't show up on day one in many industries. Um, in a lot of cases, we saw missed terminations where there was a termination, a manager knew about it, HR knew about it, IT was never notified. Um, we've also seen, by the way, I, I didn't put this here, but we've also seen certain VIPs where say another executive needs to take over a terminated executive's account, so they reactivate it and they reset the password and it's just left around because no one wants to question the current executive that's there. So it's, it just remains enabled even though it hasn't been used in years. Um, we also see decommissioned services. So some web service got decommissioned by the applications group, but maybe the sysadmins or the infrastructure group was never notified of that. Um, and again, I talked about previous directories, just artifacts that are inherited from all of the migrations from the previous directories. So there's a few things we recommend to do to assess this. First of all, you can do just a simple one-liner on PowerShell to look at accounts that haven't been used. Um, I'll also tell you, and, and Richard pointed this out earlier, there are reasons why an account might not show active use or might be disabled like a shared mailbox. And it's just still there. It's sitting around. Um, so again, be careful with this, but use this to help assess the accounts that are not in use anymore. Um, and yeah, we've got to do the dreaded personnel audit. And this is where literally we take a list of the people that work for our company and we take a list, a list of our human users, our users that should have an account, and we compare the two. Because it could very well be that you've got active use on a terminated user's account. And your PowerShell one-liner is not going to detect that. So 
it's going to have to happen. many organizations do this annually. i've even seen organizations do this on a monthly basis. but there should be an audit of personnel people who are supposed to have accounts versus the real accounts in ad. i'm going to really briefly talk through spns um but look for unnecessary accounts with spns um there is a technet url you can go to. microsoft has a single one-liner that can help you find any duplicate spns that may be in your environment ah there's also a powershell script you can run at the same link that gives you an inventory of all of your spns um and ah this is a big target for curb roasting remove anything that's unnecessary especially if an spn is tied to a human being um and then for any that's left make sure you set separate strong password policies make sure you have complexity enabled i didn't put this in the presentation but if you have the option to use a gmsa instead of a standard service account use gmsas uh, i can talk to you about that after if you're interested here's some other common findings that we see in our active directory assessments that really leaves the door open to outsiders first of all we see organizations have gpos in place for restricted groups um if you're not aware you can put a group policy in place that automatically populates the groups on a system so what many organizations have done and this is an awful awful idea anyway but to support some kind of a legacy application or to support an application where privileges aren't documented very well they give users local administrative rights or they give specific users local administrative rights horrible idea don't do it but what i've seen organizations do is they're like you know what rather than give kathy local admin rights on kathy's machine and john local admin rights on john's machine what they'll do is they'll drop in a big group like domain users in a gpo that gets auto populated on every machine and so now what you've done is to an attacker that happens to breach a single system you've guaranteed that they can move laterally to an admin level account on every machine and by the way if this policy isn't scoped properly it also populates the admins group on a domain controller does anyone know what an, the admins group on a domain controller gives someone domain admin privileges so we can see what what a bad idea this is um be careful with restricted groups gpos these i've seen these buried deep in group policy uh take a look for take a look at these um Also with GPOs, I'll just quickly mention uh look for unnecessarily enforced policies and also d- default domain policy or default domain controllers policy overrides the normal processing order of group policies. Uh on the right there's a there's a picture here of that processing order, but if someone has clicked the enforce box or they have done what we've unfortunately seen in a lot of environments for decades, and that is just put every setting that needs to be set in the environment in default domain policy that overrides the processing order and it can be a real mess to clean up and and by the way it's in those very policies that we've seen really big issues like smb signing turning off turned off for an entire environment and though on the pen test last year we had a finding smb signing wasn't required well we we enabled a gpo We turned on a GPO to require SMB signing. It's working, right? No, that default domain policy overrode it, or the default domain uh, controllers policy overrode it for DCs. Um so be careful about sprawl of default domain policy. Um also scan for service accounts, uh scan for scheduled tasks. There's a few uh tools that you can do to make that process easier. Um and also be sure to deny log on as service for human users and that includes admins if you can disable users standard users including your human admins from logging on as service or from creating privileged scheduled tasks uh you've made uh, you, you've you've closed the door to outside attackers and we've seen in in many cases there was a couple of years ago i saw a case study of a russian threat actor that was able to exfiltrate all of AD all of AD in this environment very slowly it was a low and slow dns tunneling attack with a scheduled task 
It was just a scheduled task that fired all the time on a DC and no one noticed it. Um, and it was tied to a breached human account. Um, speaking of sprawl in default domain controllers policy or default domain policy, look at hashing settings as well. Uh, I mentioned this before, there were years ago, there were legacy applications and we're thinking right around 2000, legacy applications that required, S, uh, required LM hashing to be left on or legacy systems on a domain that required LM hashing to be turned on. And so someone 20 years ago set a default domain policy to require LM hashing or to make NTLM uh, version two, NTLM version one, not the preferred option. And guess what happened? 20 years passed, no one touched it. Uh, so look for these settings. I'll mention this, and I, I realize this goes a little beyond AD, but we'd re be remiss if we didn't mention Azure AD. Um, I've talked to people before in different environments, and I've asked the question, do you use Azure AD? And, and they'll respond by saying, no, we're, we're all premise. We're premise-based systems. Well, the follow-up question is, do you, do, do you use Office 365? If the answer to that is yes, you use Azure Active Directory. And there's a few things to go over. Um, you probably have Azure AD. Um, and so there's a few things to find. These are default settings on Office 365. The last I checked, they were default settings. Um, one is Microsoft by default, every tenant with Office 365, unless something has changed recently, they allow any user in the organization to register any app. This is a horrible idea. This is, here, here's a screenshot of the setting. If you want to talk to me after, I'll tell you where it's found. Um, but do not allow user consent is what we recommend in most environments. Um, and Microsoft has, again, with almost every version or edition of Office 365, you can turn on consent requests. So even though you might not let users stand up their own apps, users can request it. And as an admin, you can choose whether to you know, answer them or ignore them and pretend you didn't get them. But admins will know about those requests that come in. Uh, another really bad setting that we see uh, is the guest user control. By default, especially if you work in an environment where there's a lot of sensitive data, users by default in the organization can share out content with any remote guest. And there's a few different places where you can go, but the primary place is this collaboration restriction. If possible, allow that only for a specific set of domains. Um, even if it's a list of no domains uh, for partners that you might want to sh uh, share with. Um, look at the risky sign-ins report. If you have Azure AD P1, uh, you can read the risky sign-ins report. If you have P2, you can be alerted and it can even take action to automatically uh, require MFA, automatically uh, even force users to come to you, effectively disabling their account for a little while. Um, but look at that risky sign-ins report. I've seen organizations before where there's been risky sign-ins from months ago where there was, there was a, a specific account got breached. They had no idea about it because they didn't look at the risky sign-ins report. Um, I think all of us know here, require MFA. Require MFA. Let's say that 10 times over. Um, uh, kill legacy authentication. Uh, Microsoft has done a lot of killing that for you, but exceptions can still be turned on. There's a lot of organizations out there that have exception policies that are way too wide. They've been opened way too much. Um, and then if you have a need for a break glass account, so an account that bypasses MFA, and there's many organizations that want to have an account that, um, that, that is tied, that there's a secret password somewhere to it's very complex, it's very strong, it's a secret password that's kept somewhere just in case MFA breaks somehow and they need to log in. Please follow Microsoft's guide on emergency access. Uh, again, the link will be here, you can download the slides, um, but Microsoft has a guide which includes anytime those accounts are used, it'll alert. Set the alerting to alert everyone and their mother if one of these break glass accounts is used. Microsoft has recommendations on them. You can have them. They tell you how to harden them properly. But just don't just turn on a break glass account and say, okay, we, we put it together, we have our fail safe. No, follow their recommendations so you make sure that account isn't breached and it's not devastating for your organization. 
Look at the admins group report in Office 365. There are numerous admin groups in Office 365. I couldn't name them all. Look at that report. Look at delegated and application permissions just like you would in AD. And I'm going to quickly say this, and this is a little bit of controversy around this, but federation configuration. Lots of environments run ADFS, Active Directory Federation Services, and they don't need to. Um, I've seen a lot of organizations do this instead of just running Azure AD with Azure AD Connect. Um, I'll tell you really quickly, if you run Azure AD, any of the premium versions of it, which again comes with most editions of Office 365, you probably can avoid some unneeded complexity and you can probably close a major attack vector by moving away from ADFS. I know there's, there's some extreme exceptions for having ADFS, but let me tell you about ADFS. It has to be exposed to the internet. Um, it requires, in many cases, um, uh, in, in, in environments where it's, it's exposed to the internet, you can't allow this, this. Not, at least not very easily. You can't just say, well, authentications just can happen from Microsoft. No, they come from the end user device. So this is not an easy service to allow list. And I'll, I'll tell you, ADFS is a magnet for password spray attacks. You see this day in and day out. And um, I'll mention very quickly, in many environments, ADFS is set up improperly. It requires a long explanation about load balancers and source IP preservation, but the password spray protection that's built into ADFS may not work just right if your network isn't set up right. And, but the question I always ask is this, why? Why do you need ADFS? Um, and there, I've, I've seen, rarely have I seen good answers here. So really question, do you really need ADFS? Let me know in person if you have some of those exceptions. I'm really interested to hear about them, but I've seen very few reasons for holding on to it. Um, tools really quickly, I'm going to close. Um, look at CIS benchmarks for Microsoft 365. They're a great starting point for securing Microsoft 365. They're freely available. Um, you can also use, CISA has a tool uh, called SCUBA. It's freely available. It will audit your environment against many best practices and show you where the door may be open in 365. And then CrowdStrike has a freeware tool as well. Just as a reminder, when we look at cleaning up our identity management systems, this is not a one-time task. Identity misconfigurations will routinely creep back in. So we need to assess, correct the problems that we found when assessing, and consistently monitor. Again, today I just talked about some of the common misconfigurations that we see in Active Directory and Azure Active Directory. Um, so, uh, so again, hopefully that was helpful for you today. Uh, as promised, here is a download link. Here's a QR code, which none of you probably will trust. Um, but does anyone have any questions? That was a joke about the QR code, by the way. I was thinking about doing a security awareness talk and the QR code taking you to a fake phishing page, just saying, hey, just kidding. Little animation after then. I'll have to try that later on. Any questions? A video of a Rickroll. A video of a Rickroll? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that gift keeps on giving after, uh, after all this time. <laughs> OK. Thank you all so much for your time. <laughs>